It's okay, I'll use this then. Okay, right. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, as, as Chris just said, I'm Sean Quigan. Uh, I'm going to give you three lectures to do with the carbon cycle. Uh, the one this morning is on just the global carbon cycle. Uh, tomorrow is going to be about the observations of the cycle, and Wednesday is going to be about modeling and using data in models of the carbon cycle. Uh, you may have picked up from Chris that my real expertise is in the terrestrial carbon cycle, so the land carbon cycle, but I'm going to talk about the land and the ocean and show how they fit together. Okay. Let's start off. So what my lecture is going to be about this morning, it's, um, it is the, the, the overall picture. So I'm going to talk about the global average temperature in the atmosphere, the role of carbon dioxide and methane in climate, and in fact in global warming, and then the, co the global carbon cycle and its components. That's what I intend to do in the next 50 minutes. Okay, let's start from, if we ask ourselves, what's the, what's the Earth's natural temperature? So if you'd stripped out, we know about greenhouse gases, so I'll use the phrase now. If we stripped out, we just had an, an atmosphere which is composed of just p the current mix of nitrogen, and, which is about 78%, and oxygen, which is about 21%. And you say, what would its natural temperature be? Well, you can calculate this by like, by the radiation type calculations and by the amount of radiation which is impinging on the Earth from the sun. And it comes, from, you can see the calculation on there. Basically, under those circumstances, the average temperature of the Earth would be about minus six degrees. But in fact, the, the average temperature observed is about 15. Okay, so there's a huge difference between what you'd expect from balancing, from balanced black body and what we actually see. Uh, let me just make a comment about this, by the way. This is not the Earth in equilibrium. The Earth in equilibrium would not have the atmosphere it has now. It wouldn't have any oxygen for a start. It would have a, an atmosphere which is pr mainly probably about 97% carbon dioxide. It would be a very warm planet, not as warm as Venus, but very warm. The, the reason it doesn't have that atmosphere is because of life. Okay, so we have this anomaly between what the Earth's uh, minus six degrees and 15. So where's it come from? Why, what's causing the difference? Well, the people who got some idea about this, who were f first pointed the way, were Fourier said there has to be some sort of energy exchange in the atmosphere to make this happen. So he didn't give any details on that, but that was his, he, that was his theory, his, his speculation. And in 1860, John Tyndall measured the, the absorption of infrared radiation by CO2 and water vapor and realized this would, that they would absorb heat, basically, um, the, uh, would absorb radiation and hence uh, be able to um, absorb heat, to hold heat in the, in, in, in the system. Another major step forward was this guy, uh, was Arrhenius, who in 1896 postulated that the, that the CO2 in the atmosphere could effectively make the Earth behave like a, a greenhouse. So he came up with this... Uh, with this phrase, uh, greenness. I'm sorry, I can't read this because I've left my glasses at the hotel, so I'll just <laughs> so, and the, the writing's a bit small. Um, but he, he did talk about this idea of a hothouse. Um, and he'd made a calculation, which is the one in yellow on the uh, bottom right, which says that for if you double CO2 in the atmosphere, you'd expect the temperature to rise between five and seven degrees at the surface. Now, that calculation is still about right. So his back-of-the-envelope calculations are what are the sort of values we think now. Oh, oh by the way, the, the, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is only about 0.03%. It's a real trace gas, but it's having an enormous effect on the, on the temperature. Uh, I should also say that the analogy of the... Um, people have this idea that the... The greenhouse effect is you've got a layer of gas and it lets the, 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 the radiation in and, oh, and, uh, and then traps it going out. That's not how a greenhouse works. The major effect in the greenhouse is it's to, it cuts down convection. So it's not quite the right analogy. In, in, for the Earth, it is stopping gases, stopping radiation comes in at long wavelengths and then can't escape. Uh, it comes in at short wavelengths and the long wavelengths can't escape. Oh, can't all escape, so that warms it. Whereas in the, in the greenhouse, it's 
reducing convection. So from those early uh, thoughts came this, this idea of the greenhouse effect. And this is in the IPCC 20, 2007. It just restates what I've just said, that without the natural greenhouse effect, the average temperature of the Earth's surface would be below 0 degrees centigrade. In that calculation, it was minus 6. Depending on how you do your calculation, it, people come up with different numbers, but it's certainly cold. This natural greenhouse effect makes life, as we know it, possible. However, human activities, primarily the burning of fossil fuels and the clearing of forests, have greatly intensified the natural greenhouse effect, causing global warming. And the current IPCC says, or more recent ones, say roughly the same thing. Okay. And that's a picture of what the greenhouse, how the greenhouse effect works. In fact, the first warning sign of this, or more specific warning sign about the effects of human activity on the greenhouse effect was produced by, in 1940 by a calendar who was working, a, a British scientist, who he calculated the warming due to burning fossil fuels. So people, he was aware that if you, if you burn gas and you burn oil, then you would get a warming effect. But there were no alarm bells from that at that point. And then in 1958, this guy here, Charles Keeling, he was a, a graduate student, and he didn't want to spend his, his life staying with a computer, even back in 1928, mind you, in about 1950s, he wanted to be staying at a computer in those days. He wanted to spend his time outdoors uh, as a PhD student, if he could. But he took on this task of trying to measure um, CO2 in the atmosphere, um, which is apparently, I don't know the details, it's actually a rather complicated and, and it's a very difficult experiment to make accurately. Um, oh, by the way, this graph and probably the next one are, are two of the most important graphs published in the whole 20th century as regards environmental science. You'll see the next, the, you know, they're both to do with carbon dioxide, but this is one of the real um, signposts. Okay, when, when, so when he started to make these measurements, based, if you like, on the sort of warning in the first line of, from Calendar Man, he, he wanted to put the, uh, the measurements somewhere where he had a clean atmosphere. He didn't want it to be um, polluted by local industry or cities. So it's actually up on top of the Mauna Loa extinct volcano in uh, Hawaii. Since 1958, these measurements of the, CO2, of, of the CO2 in the atmosphere have been measured continuously. And along there's about now five or six stations which measure CO2. And you can look them up if on, to, on the CDIAC, I should have put it on, the carbon dioxide information a centre. I've got what it is, but I can check out and give you if you need it. And this is the sort of curve he found. This is the curve he found. This goes up to 2010, I think. Well, there are two rather obvious features of that curve. What do you think they are? If you were to look at that curve, what does that curve tell me? Have you any ideas? What would you pick out as the, as the important things? Seasonality. Hmm? Seasonality is one. Seasonality and continuous rise. And gradual rise. Okay, so the obvious thing is that the CO2 is rising in the atmosphere, and it's rising in an accelerating way. And the second thing is the seasonality, so we get a, an, an, an oscillation every, um, every year. Do you think the high parts of the oscillation. Now, do you think they're in summer or winter? Would there be more CO2 in the atmosphere in summer or in winter? Any ideas? If I tell you this is Northern Hemisphere, Hawaii is in the Northern Hemisphere, would that help you? Come on, don't be shy. Or I say, someone said winter. Do you know why? 
Yeah, okay. So then what we're seeing there is that you're seeing that the, in winter, uh, what you're looking at is the biosphere of, of affecting the, the CO2 signal. Because in winter, there's less activity in the northern hemisphere. So there's less CO2 being drawn down through photosynthesis, and so the CO2 is higher. Okay, so that's the signal. And if this is southern hemisphere, there's, there's much less land in there. You see an outer phase uh, link there. Okay, so, so, that's, so this is telling you straight away that the Earth is responding as a system to that, to that signal. We'll come back to that oscillation uh, as we go along. This is the second most important environmental uh, science plot of the 20th century, again, in my opinion. Uh, it's a rather old plot. It's from Petit in 1999. And what was done, they drilled an ice core in Vostok in uh, Antarctica. And from that, they could measure the uh, CO2 in the gas trapped in the, in the ice. And on this plot, on the left and on the black, you have the, um, you have the CO2. And in the red, you have the temperature. And it's across the, the last... It's 400,000 years along the bottom. So this is the present. Oh. And this is the past. And what you're looking at there is interglacials, which are the period of about 120,000 years. What you see also is that the temperature and the CO2 track each other very well. So there's a very strong link between CO2 and between the Earth's global temperature. Now, it would be quite simple, well, not simple, it would be, I could give a complete lecture on just this slide alone or on the previous slide alone, and we could just talk about these pictures, because, I mean, I'd have given my, I'd given my, my, my wife to, to produce this, uh, this, this plot. It's, this, is, this is a dream. I also know someone who, who worked on this in the Vostok Corps. He is, uh, they, they had a very, so they drilled these ice cores into the, into the, into the ice, and they had a very nice sideline because it was a Russian station. And so when they've melted out the cores, they've got water. And they used the water to make vodka. And they then could sell it as being vodka from water that was, was on the earth a quarter of a million years ago. So a very nice sideline. OK, but you see there's a natural oscillation. And we're, the, the CO2 on the left-hand side is between about 100 and, uh, this is about 108, 175, up to about, say, 3 to 310. That was the sort of range of the oscillations, or something like that, 280. OK, so that's the natural. Now, where are we now? That was 2002, OK? So clearly, something drastic has happened in the last two decades, three decades, or two decades since that was done. And this, of course, we're, gonna, we're going to carry this forward. So whatever's happening now, we're way outside the um, millennial um, behavior of, of CO2. Other things are changing as well very rapidly. So these, these are greenhouse gases. So the, the top one is carbon dioxide. You've just, it's effectively the same as the plot I've just shown you. The one below is methane. The one below is nitrous oxide. Every one of those sharp upturns are almost a clear sign of human activity because each one of those is driven largely by what humans are doing to the planet. Now, each gas there has a, an, an efficiency in, in terms of um, being able to warm the atmosphere. And it's called, it's, uh, it's global warming potential, it's radiative efficiency. And on there I've written CO2 and methane and uh, nitrous oxide. And on the, everything's done relative to CO2, okay? And you'll notice that CO2 has a, it, there are three timelines there. There's a, there's a 20 years, 100 years, now 500 years. Now, l let me explain what that means. It means that if you put this gas into the atmosphere, it's what its potential to warm the, uh, the, the Earth will be in 20 years' time, in 100 years' time, in 500 years' time. You'll notice that CO2 is one. It doesn't change. The reason for that is because
because CO2 in the atmosphere is effectively inert. It, hasn't, it doesn't do any chemistry. It just sits there. Well, not quite. As we'll see, we'll see what it really does. But it doesn't react. So it has as much potential to warm the atmosphere now as it had when it was put into the atmosphere. So things that were put in at the start of the Industrial Revolution are still effectively warming the Earth. CH4, methane, it, it does decay. Its decay time is between about 9 and 12 years. It reacts with the OH radical. Uh, and so if you put it back gas in now, it'll have a certain potential in 20 years, in 20 years' time. It'll decay as time goes on. But you'll see it's much greater potential than CO2. And N2O, uh, again, that, that its lifetime is about 114 years, so it's a long, long-lived gas. And it has an even much, much greater potential to warm the atmosphere. So, but the one which has the biggest actual warming effect because of the amount in the atmosphere is CO2. And uh, maybe you can't read this very well at the back. Um, but this is from the 2001 IPCC, I think. Um, and this just shows you the... the um, the natural forcing of the climate. Um, it's effectively to do with what would be the effect on the um, temperature of the tropos at the top of the troposphere due to these various effects. And in there, on the left-hand side, are the various uh, gases, stratospheric, stratospheric ozone, tropospheric ozone, sulfates, and biomass burning, and various other things. What you'll see that by far the biggest effect is due to the greenhouse gases. And within there, the biggest single effect is CO2 slightly different version of the same plot is, is this one. Um, and what is, the numbers are essentially the same. It's, it's, it's slightly updated, but, it, but basically it's the same story. Again, you'll see the left-hand side is CO2. Sorry, this, come on. This mouse isn't, come on, come on. Oh, rats, sorry. So CO2 is the left-hand one. The, ones, the next one is, is CH4, um, nitrous oxide, and various uh, CSEs, for example. But the, 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 the important difference on this one is the right-hand column shows you the net anthropogenic component. So how much of all this, all this warming came due to human activities? You'll see that the, the, current, the current calculations indicate that a very large lump of the warming potential is coming from, radiative forcing is coming from the human activity. Okay, now let's start to break this down a little bit into, into so we've, 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 I've, I've talked about gas in the atmosphere, but how does it get there and what, what happens when it does get there? So we have this, um, the, the overall carbon cycle, where the, the, the means by which carbon dioxide gets into the atmosphere and the way it comes out. And this is shown here. Now, this is a rather old plot, uh, but I wanted to show it because it contains two things, which unfortunately, again, because the room is quite large and the numbers are quite small, you probably can't read very well. But it's showing you that the, the, the two things on here, one is stores, how big, the, um, how much carbon there is in the different parts of the, uh, so in the ocean, in the atmosphere, and the land. And then there are arrows showing the fluxes. So it's giving you the size of the stocks and the size and direction of the fluxes. And what you'll see, for example, in the, the um, come on. Sorry, I'm not finding this mouse very well. It doesn't want to play, it's not that, it just won't play this. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to describe this rather than... Uh, it's using laser pointers, it's fine. Yeah, using laser pointers. yeah, it's better, yeah, I'm sorry about it. Okay, so, um, so for example, fossil fuels is a major input to the atmosphere, uh, but on this side you have, um, you have land use changes also kind of input to the atmosphere, but then you've also got... Uh, um, um, carbon dioxide being pulled down in, in, in growth, in the ocean, you've got absorption. Or, or you get water, which uh, CO2 will dissolve in water. 
he may be taken into phytoplankton in through, through, uh, through photosynthesis. So this contains the, uh, the processes as well as the stocks. However, so, that's, so it contains both the natural carbon cycle and the human carbon cycle, the human component of that. Now, one of the things I mentioned there was photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is important because it's a way of removing CO2 from the atmosphere, and it's by this reaction here. Okay. And this is the one that actually generates our oxygen, most of which comes from the ocean eventually. So, but this is a way in which, human, in the natural carbon cycle, this is one of the primary ways in which we remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Going back to, um, actually I'll skip that, it's, 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 it's what we've talked about before. This one is a more up-to-date version of this uh, carbon cycle diagram. And this one jo is, jo shows just the human perturbations of the carbon cycle. Okay, it's not got the natural flows on, it's got the human flows on them. Um, You'll, you'll notice this thing up here. Several of the slides I've, I'm going to use in this in the rest of the talk are taken from the Global Carbon Project. Global Pro Carbon Project every year publishes an, an update on the global carbon cycle. If you look it up on the web, you can get many of these slides and a lot more from, from this talk. And there's also Le Carré is, 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 the, is always the lead author. So that paper there gives you the current status of the... Uh, of the of global carbon cycle. Now, these numbers are our current understanding of what the humans are doing to the, to the atmosphere. The, oh, I, did, I forgot to say something. Uh, this is important. Um, when people are describing carbon cycle, they use two sorts of units. They use either carbon units or CO2 units. And they work in terms of picogram, which is 10 to 9 tons or 1 gigaton. Now that's, if, if you, since the atomic weight of oxygen is 16 and of, and of carbon is 12, if you want to convert c carbon to CO2, multiply by 44 over 12 or 11 over 3. So that slide is in carbon units. This one is in CO2 units. Okay. And you have to be careful because there was, uh, Jonathan Amos was, uh, from the BBC was going to publish an article and he had all the numbers wrong because he thought he was looking at carbon units. He was, in fact, looking at CO2 units, so he, he actually checked an article with me before he published it. Okay, so on this, you'll see that there are not only the flows, which are fossil fuels, this is the growth in the atmosphere, this is land use change, this is the land sink, and this is the ocean sink. On there are also uncertainties, Now I'm going to talk a little bit about more of those in a minute. So suppose we want to balance the carbon budget. Well, you've got two processes. You've got what goes up. Now, if it's CO2, what goes up stays there forever. It won't decay. The gas is inert. It will stay there forever unless it goes, flows somewhere. Now, CO2 is too heavy to evaporate. Hydrogen can evaporate, but CO2 can't. So if you, if you want to lose carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, you've got to let it flow back into the surface. Now, if you want to balance the budget, you let's see what you've got here. On the left-hand side, these are what goes up. So fossil fuels, and if you clear a forest, it decays or burn it, then you get another source. This is called the land use change source. On the right-hand side, you've got where the... You, if you measure in the atmosphere, this, what stays in the atmosphere, isn't the same as what you put into the atmosphere. So you've got to lose a certain fraction, about half of the, what you put into the atmosphere doesn't stay there. And about half of it, well, a quarter of it goes into the land, and about another quarter of it goes into the ocean. And you'll see that, that now, let, this is a slightly old slide. Let me just leave it there. But the, the, uh, I, I don't want to say much more about it, except to point out the, the uncertainties. The major uncertainties on this particular uh, measurements or estimates are on the two land components. You'll see here on the land use uh, change source, it's about a 50% uncertainty, and I think that's optimistic. And on the land use sink, that's um, 
that's carbon dioxide flowing back into the atmosphere through photosynthesis, it's around about 25%. And I, again, th get th I think that's also very optimistic. Uh, sorry, it's, that's about 25% of the total figure. And the largest single uncertainty is in this land use sink. This is a more up-to-date one, and weather. so the, those are the current numbers, but without the uncertainties. So that's the one that's... And what's happened recently is that this, up until the last two years, has not been estimated. It's just been made to work. So this plus this minus this and this would leave us this. So, but now the feeling is that this, our data are good enough to estimate the land use sink, and so these are estimates. However, this doesn't balance. This is meant to be a balanced budget. In fact, there's an imbalance of about 6%. So there's something wrong in our estimates of these things, and we don't know where the, where the error is. It almost certainly isn't there, because measuring this is quite good. This is becoming a big problem. Once upon a time, we knew a lot about fossil fuel emissions because it was mainly in the uh, developed world and we use the energy and transport numbers and we soon knew about this. This, the uncertainty on this is growing considerably now because of new power stations in China, for example. So this would have, was our anchor at one point. This was the one number we could trust and this is one we can always measure very well. But that one is now becoming more and more uncertain. So the uncertainties on the other ones are becoming less and less able to be characterized. This is another picture of the balance. The plus sides are what goes up, and the downside are what comes down. Okay, so this goes what goes into the atmosphere, and this comes out of the atmosphere. It goes back to 1900 to 2010, 2020, right about now actually. Okay, on the top side you see fossil fuels, and this is land use change. And you'll see that up until around about the middle of the 20th century, land use change, or a clearing of forests, was actually the dominant contribution of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. But in recent years, it's an, an ex, and increasingly so, it's our use of fossil fuels. So now 90% well, of this is, is the fossil fuels and 10 is the land use change. On the bottom side, you'll see where the CO2 goes. This is what stays in the atmosphere. This is what goes into the ocean. And this is what goes into the land. There's two quite, well, there's several remarkable things about that plot. One is that as we drive the atmosphere harder by pushing more um, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, the land and ocean respond. They grow at the same time. So the Earth is responding as a system to the forcing we're putting on it. So both the ocean sink and the land sink are growing. They're not growing fast enough to keep this... To, the, the, so the actual imbalance is getting bigger. But the actual, but, but, but these, the ocean and land are slowing down the effects of the warming of our use of fossil fuels, our unwise use of fossil fuels. So they're acting on our behalf. The other thing that's worth seeing is that there's a lot of variation in the atmosphere, but you'll see there's very little atmosphere variation in the ocean. So the variation in the atmosphere is being driven by, it's not variation in fossil fuels, it's variation in what the land is doing. So the prim primary control on the interannual variability of the atmospheric CO2 signal is the land. And that's because the land can change quite quickly. You can have droughts, you can have, you have El Nino events, you get droughts, you get, you get excessive warmth and rain in some parts of the world, you get excessive droughts in others. And this, these, these control this variability. So the land is not only the one about which where there is the most uncertainty, it's also the one in which it is the major control on variability. S same sort of diagram um, shown in different ways. This is a, this is a 2002 picture, but I quite like it 
Because again, what it's showing there is the fossil fuels at the top and the accumulation in the atmosphere in the gray and the gap between the uh, two of them is, is, is where the, is, is, is what's not accounted for. So the fossil fuels are going here. This is the gap between the, uh, the, the what stays in the atmosphere and what's in the, in the, in what you put into the atmosphere. So this is the land and ocean. Now immediately what you can see that there is huge variability in each year between what goes into the land and ocean. Again, controlled mainly by the land. And in some years, in fact, there are, the land, instead of taking up, or the land and ocean, instead of taking up carbon dioxide, so acting as a sink, they effectively become a source. So some years, the, the, the fossil fuel emissions are bigger than what's being taken up by the land and ocean. So, but huge variability. This is not quite complete because on top of this, you've got to put land use change. So, but this is just the fossil fuels. I'm showing this graph because you saw that the, uh, I started off from the natural variability of the CO2, which we saw was between about 280 and, uh, 180 and 300. This year, last year, was the first year when CO2 never fell below 400 parts per million. So it's been rising just in, inexorably for, for decades, and now it's above 400. Okay, and that's in the forecast. Well, this 216 was above 400 parts per million. It's a minor lower again. It's forecast to be 4 and 6.8 in, uh, in this year, uh, last year. Okay, now, where, when we're talking about the contributions to the, to the carbon cycle, who's, where, where are the fossil fuel emissions coming from? Well, this is a breakdown by country. Um, it's over since 1958. This is when the Mauna Loa me measurement started. And what you'll see that for, if you like, the developed countries, our use of fossil fuels is tending to slowly decline. These are total emissions in gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. So Japan, Europe, and the uh, you know, developed countries, and the, and the USA, um, in fact, in all the developed countries, the trend is to reduce the uh, emissions of CO2. Um, Australia is an anomaly in that it's not doing that very well. But you'll see where things are, are not like that. China, there's an enormous uh, increase in, in emissions in China. Uh, India is also significant. And this is the... Um, the rest of the uh, developed world here, and um, sorry, the, the, the non-developed countries. Bunker fuel is for, for ships and so on. That's also, that's transport up there. So basically, uh, currently, the current China's driving the, uh, the rise in CO2 due to fossil fuels, and it's because of the huge numbers of um, small coal-driven power stations. Also, India's building coal power stations, and will continue to do so for the next decades. And in, in fact, the sort of coal that's been used is particularly not good for, in terms of um, emissions in the atmosphere. So that's one of the sources to the, that's, that's the, wh where is fossil fuels, where are fossil fuels coming from? This is from the land use change component and you'll see that, again, it's from 1958 up until the present. And this is due to deforestation, degradation. And you'll see that, again, this is uh, only about 10% of the total. In fact, it was up to about 25% at one point. But you'll see, again, there's a lot of variability between years. There's a lot of uncertainty. You can also see that some events can have a gigantic effect. So this one was the Indonesian fires at that single event, which was a huge set of fires over, over Indonesia, which gave terrible air quality in Singapore and Malaysia and so on, that put an eighth of the total CO2 loading into the atmosphere in, from, from that single event in that year. So these things can, can be gigantic. This was another bad year um, in, in uh, there's been a lot of fires, actually not quite as serious in terms of CO2 loading, but 250. 2015 was another bad year. It doesn't show up so well on here. But we've been looking at the fires in, in, uh, 
in Indonesia. I'm not quite sure why it doesn't show such a large signal. Okay, and that shows, you know, the, the, against the same story, there's the CO2 emissions, there's the general decline in land use emissions, but it's still, and this is about 10, this is about 90%, this is about 10%. If you look at the concentration, this is a, a picture of the, of, of the concentration of, of, CO, of CO2 in the atmosphere. And you'll see there are very big spikes, which typically are upwards, of, of, of big positive spikes. These are typically connected with an El Nino year. So in, the, in El Nino years, you're getting large emissions, largely because of drought. And when you get drought, you get reduced photosynthesis and you also get larger emissions from soil respiration. So, and a lot of a, drought is a, is a significant effect over large parts of the planet of the El Nino years. The ocean sink is a much more, it's a quieter sort of behavior. Um, this shows various estimates of the ocean sink. And it's not just, this isn't just, it isn't simply observation based, it's based on models of the ocean, because our understanding of the ocean uh, sink is based, is based on measurements from ships, for example, it's based on models, and it's based on gas measurements. And so there is a lot of vari variation in the different models and different estimates, but basically they all say, tell you the same story. There's a steady uh, climb in the ocean sink, so it's responding to the driving of the CO2 being put into the atmosphere. Uh, and it's just, it's got variability, but not at all the level of variability that the atmosphere has, uh, the, the, the land has. I'll skip that. Okay. What I want to do now on the next two slides is just show you, it's really a preparation for the next lecture, but I want to show you what goes into the, what, what are the processes that go into the carbon cycle for the land and for the ocean? Okay, so we've talked about natural fluxes. And these are, oh, so I want to do in both cases to show you what those natural fluxes consist of. So the, the land carbon cycle, and this is the natural one, it's not the the previous slides were talked about the disturbance to the natural cycle, or the, what human beings were doing. This is the natural cycle. What you've got is that the, the primary effect is photosynthesis. Photosynthesis pulls out about 120 billion tons of carbon from the atmosphere per year. A plant, for its metabolism, just to stay alive, respires CO2. And so and about half of that goes, is, is then respired back to the atmosphere. So that leaves you with 60 billion tonnes. These are numbers, these are about, these are approximate. That quantity there is then used, is available for plants to build plant material. So they've, they've, they've got carbon dioxide and they can now use it to, to do things. So that's, what they, that's effectively what they pull down from the atmosphere. That's quite a big number, uh, and then, but then the soils also respire carbon dioxide, so there's a balance between pl plant material which goes into the soil and then what, what happens in the soil. So soil respiration loses about 55 billion tonnes of carbon from that, so that leaves you with five. And then you get a disturbance, and there's various sorts of disturbance, which I'll talk about tomorrow. What this has shown is fire. And what's left over when you do that is about two billion tons of carbon of, 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 um, uh, that is the number that the, the, the land biosphere takes out of the atmosphere. Okay? So you start from a very big number, and you come down to a very small number. But in climate terms, that's the one that matters, because that's, what, that's how much carbon dioxide has been taken from the atmosphere per year by the land, roughly. Okay. And to get this number, you're going to have to actually, f to figure out where it comes from, you're going to have to get these other numbers, 
these other ones right. You'll also see you're trying to calculate quite a small proportion of a very big number. So the scope for uh, getting this wrong is considerable. Okay, so that's the land carbon cycle and the processes which go into it. For the ocean carbon cycle, it, it's a very different story. The, f the first thing is that there's, uh, it's not all, uh, I've talked about, on, on the land we have vegetation and soil, so, but we, uh, we don't have a very deep uh, uh, medium or m to deal with. In the ocean, you've got a very, very deep layers and you've got surface layers. Now, the reaction of the, with the atmosphere is clearly in the ocean layers, in the, in the surface layers. And the reaction can be in two ways. One is through carbon dioxide being a, dissolved in the water, that's, and that's called the... Um, um, it's not the physical pump, it's the salt, sorry, dis, dissolve, dissolution pump, something like that. It's, it's to do with the fact that you actually you just dissolve water, you dissolve carbon dioxide into water to get carbonic acid. The other place you can pull carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is by um, photosynthesis. So plankton, phytoplankton, photosynthesized like, plant, like uh, land vegetation does, and so they pull um, uh, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So you've got, in this case, is the, this is the um, biological pump. So you've got a physical pump and a biological pump, but then things flow. Whereas on the land, roughly speaking, things are static. But if you're going to deal with the ocean component of the carbon cycle, you've got to allow for the fact that water flows. Water flows both sideways, and that carries nutrients, and, it carries, and you carry in, in the temperature differences, and it flows up and down. So deep water, so in fact what we know is that in the ocean, in the ocean circulation, we get large transfer of ocean, of, of warm water from the tropics to the towards the poles. In the poles, it, you, you, it, so we have the Atlantic conveyor where water sinks in the northern Atlantic. And in doing so, this is surface water, in doing so, it buries CO2 and takes it into the deep layers. And the circulation time is centuries. So the deep ocean, large parts of it has never even seen it. It doesn't, it doesn't know that the uh, Industrial Revolution happened yet. We just doesn't know about the CO2 that's up there. So it's a very long-term potential sink. Also, the, the thing is that the, the temperature of seawater matters a lot for how much CO2 it will carry. So warm water will carry less CO2 than cold, than cold water. Okay. So the, the northern Atlantic and the, and the Arctic oceans are, are better able to take CO2 out of the atmosphere than the tropics, and the tropics can even be a source of CO2 if, as water warms. So the two media are quite... Both land and ocean are quite different. Okay, what I want to do in my last five to minutes is, is now talk about the other gas, and this is just a, a set of slides taken directly from the um, from the Global Carbon Project. Uh, I want to talk about methane partly because the our ability to observe it, observe it from space is considerable these days, and it's actually easier in many ways than measuring CO two. Um, it's also an important greenhouse gas, and it's a carbonaceous gas. Okay, the, the context for methane is the following. Okay, first of all, it is the second most important greenhouse gas. It's got it's 28 times larger than CO2. I've said this already over a time horizon of 100 years. It produces about 20% of the total warming from all greenhouse gases so far. It's 150% above pre-industrial levels. And its lifetime is about nine. Well, this is nine. You see different numbers. Nine to 12 years, you see, so as, a, as a lifetime. So you can, um, you can remove it. Whereas CO2, you can't remove it very easily because it's, it's inert. In this one, you can remove it because it will react chemically if you, can, if you can make that produce something that will actually produce it. But this is typically the OH radical. It's... Um, it's not particularly good also because it contributes to tropospheric production of ozone, and that's whereas high ozone is, we like it because we, we, talk, we worry about the ozone hole because it protects us from uh, ultraviolet radiation. But down at ground level, it's very bad for crops and bad for health. And it also leads to uh, 
production of water vapour in the stratosphere, and so it enhances global warming. So basically, it's, it's good and bad, depending on what you do with it. But that shows how radically it's changed in, in recent times since the Industrial Revolution. Now, it, it's, um, I can't, we can't draw a simpler diagram as we can for um, CO2 for, for methane. It's produced and it's lost in various ways. One of the, these show the principal ones in there. Fossil fuels is one of them. So forest burning, uh, forest burning is another. So you'll measure methane when you get forest fires. A major contributor is our agricultural, how we deal with agriculture and waste. So um, you, as, as things rot down, they produce methane. A major natural a source of methane is wetlands. So we use the word marsh gas in Britain, or used to be used to work the phrase marsh gas, which is the, the gas you'll get um, from just mires and from, from from bogs and so on. And we talk about will of the wisp. Will of the wisp was a ghost that you'd see if you went up on the moors at night, because this methane can spontaneously catch fire. And so you'll get these, these wisps of, of flame, and these were thought of as ghosts in the past. And then there are other, uh, there's landfill, there's uh, leaking gas lines uh, for, our, for our fuels and so on. And then the, the way to get it out of the atmosphere, you, could, you can get a, your various chemical reactions. As I said, the principal one is the reaction with the OH radical. And there's also some, chem some of the uh, methane is taken up in soils. But this is a very complicated story. Uh, you'll see that only some of that is under human control. Uh, we can't do a lot about wetlands. Well, we can drain them, which is a bad thing to do anyway. We can maybe reduce the amount of biomass burning we do. We certainly can affect how, we, how our farming operates, and then certainly we can do things about the emissions due to fossil fuels. This shows the growth rate. Um, going back to 19, the middle of the 1980s. And you'll see that it went, this, these plots are not very well understood, I might add. Um, this is the, uh, the growth rate in parts per billion. It's, it's a much lower percentage in the atmosphere than, uh, than CO2. And it went flat for a while, and now it started to rise again. Now, if, because it's got a, not a particularly long lifetime, you probably, unlike CO2, when you see changes, you're looking at flows, differences in flows to and from the atmosphere. When you're looking at, CO, at CH4, you're looking probably at chemistry or changes in the, in, the, in the sources. So this could be because of the OH, there was more OH radical that kept things level. It could be there were different, there were the, that we would, um, well, quite frankly, it's not, it's not clear what that is. It could be that we were actually being more efficient in, in not losing uh, uh, gas from pipelines. It's not clear, but also it's not clear what's causing this increase, because now it's starting to turn up again, and this is a worrying increase. So, so there's quite a lot of un not understood physics and um, observation of what people on the planet's doing that go into this diagram. And if you want to see where it's happening, well, the wetlands, northern Canada and, uh, and northern, northern US, the Brazilian uh, areas, the Pantanal down in the southern, southern Amazon, wetlands of the Congo, over in the, um, the Mekong and so on in Southeast Asia and in the, uh, in the tropics, very many of the wetlands are in the tropics and, and these are very efficient uh, ways of getting methane into the atmosphere. Fossil fuels, it, with the usual suspects, it, it's, it's us, it's the developed countries in many cases, but all, increasingly it's China. Agriculture and waste, you'll see the, the, the major agricultural centers in the US, in the, in the Eastern uh, South America, Europe, uh, India, and China. And then there's biomass burning, which is the uh, Southern Amazon, which happens in the August of so each year in, the, uh, in Africa, this is the rainforest, actually, typically sub -Sahara, sub in the southern part of Africa where you get the burning, and then in Southeast Asia. 
Okay. So, um, to summarize what I've said in that lecture is, the Earth responds in a very complex way to a wide range of forcings, and many of them are anthropogenic, that we, 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 we do them. Uh, the mean temperature is strongly correlated with, and it's affected by the concentration of atmospheric CO2, but also CH4. Uh, greenhouse gas forcing has changed sharply since the Industrial Revolution, re revolution and current atmospheric gases are way, way out of the natural um, um, bounds they were operating in, in the last half million years. An absolutely central role is the CO2, uh, but, but also CO4, but, and also the N2O, but that's not, not carbonaceous, and the CFCs, which are chlorofluorocarbons, which are even worse in terms of heating effect, but they're smaller and being brought down because of the uh, Montreal Protocol to protect the ozone. And then the land and ocean play roughly equal parts in mitigating the buildup of CO2 in the atmosphere. So they're helping us to, to reduce the effects of our rampant use of fossil fuels. The land is a much higher, stronger control on the variability in the atmosphere. But in the long term, the ocean is probably the, is the one which is where we can bury most CO2, but it just takes a long time. So in terms of policy, most of our efforts are concentrated on what we can do on the land. Okay, and that's the end of my first lecture. Any questions? Yep. Um, so first of all, thank you for your presentation. Um, I was wondering if you heard about um, these proposals to basically um, extract CO2 from the atmosphere. So for example, there is now an experimental plant in Iceland where they um, are taking out CO2 from the um, ambient air and storing it in volcanic stone. And the idea is that over time, this CO2 will become um, stone. And from what I read, they um, are currently taking out around 50 tons per year. Um, so what is your opinion on these types of proposals? Do you think that that's a way that we will have to consider um, going? Or do you think that that's a distraction from the um, challenge that is uh, reducing our CO2 emissions? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Good question. There, there, there are essentially two approaches to, to dealing with this. One is, one is the sort of thing you're describing whereby you try to um, n not emit the CO2, so you actually clean it from your, uh, if in, in a, in a, in a um, power plant, for example. You simply reduce the emissions. Okay, and you are... Uh, and the second one is uh, more of a geoengineering uh, approach where you, you try and, once it's in the atmosphere, you then you take it out through various means. And one of them is, as you say, to bury the CO2 in various places. Um, one of them, for example, would be, one of them is to put it into aquifers, uh, or into, is to pump it into... Um, where you've removed oil, for example, and then, and then or you can put it into the deep ocean. If you deep ocean, it turns into a sort of jelly. The big worry then is how safe are those reservoirs? And if things go wrong, will you then get some sort of major um, out, outflow of, of carbon dioxide? Then there are really interesting geoengineering ones. Um, one of them is, for example, to put, uh, in, well, 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 in fact, I work for someone in, in as part of what's called the Centre for Climate Change Mitigation in, in Sheffield. It's, uh, and what we are working on is you can increase, weathering is one way, when stone weathers, rock weathers, it reduces, it pulls carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And if you use powdered basalt, as a, and spread it on marginal lands for, and it acts as a fertilizer, this 
greatly accelerates the amount, the, 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 the rate of weathering, and you can pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere quite rapidly doing that. So we're actually exploring that method of doing so. Um, there are, you can try and emulate photosynthesis, and there are uh, wishes to do that. Then the other sorts of, uh, of geoengineering are not often are not to manipulate CO2, but to mani manipulate temperature or manipulate radiation. So putting sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere to uh, reflect back sunlight and so on and so on, or flying big shields. So there's various scary and, 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 uh, and uh, ambitious possibilities to actually reduce the effects of the warming we're producing due to CO2. But some of the easiest things we can do are actually just to be more intelligent in our use of fossil fuels and our use of land because we have considerable potential to use the land and our uh, technology for green, clean energy to improve the, to improve the situation. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Yeah, Sorry, would you mind just going back to the plot of the country, Which one? country wise emissions? Sure. Um, I noticed sort of towards in the last five or so years, like a slight down. Uh, where would I put it? Uh, I think so it's I past it. Oh, yeah. Which one is it? Um, no, no, it's not that. Back a little bit. <laughs> uh, hang on a minute, where is it? Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That one. Oh, that one. Oh, no, that's one. That's one. Sorry, um, I had another one like that, and it's a different <laughs> one, but never mind. Go on. Um, in the last sort of three or so years, in most of the countries, you can see a sort of marginal plateauing or decline. Yeah. Um, uh, in this bottom end, uh, yeah, the bottom side, not, not in the, not the top end. Um, okay. Well, would you say that... Oh, okay. Um, do you think that's a... Po positive uh, oh, oh, sure. of the last few years, or is oh, that oh, just oh, a very... Oh, yeah, yeah, thing? yeah, this is things like... Well, in, in, in the developed world, we've become even, more... We've even become China and India seem to be... Oh, well, be careful. You've got to look, no, be careful. You've got to look at the thickness of the block. It's the thickness is actually... It's not getting, it's not getting any thinner. This is getting thinner, and this is getting thinner but that's not getting thinner, and that's not getting thinner, and that's not getting thinner, and that's not. So the, uh, but what you're seeing there, what's happening in, the, in, in, in places with, with lots of money, where they can afford to build um, um, alternative uh, green energy, they become more energy efficient, you build homes which are more energy efficient. So in these countries, we, we've got the money to actually turn to do things better. When you've got a developing economy in China, India, and you're wanting to bring people out of poverty, you need you have to do what you do. So, but China, I mean, but having said that, China's a leader in in, uh, in green energy. Vietnam is a, is a world leader in Vietnam in green energy. So these people aren't they're not they're not blind. And certainly, China isn't blind. They know what they're doing, and they they want to become world leader in in, in more in, in this climate change and in the. Um, in the fiasco that was the uh, Trump withdrawing from the Paris Accord, China made a very strong statement about their willingness to effectively lead the world in in uh, in, in reducing the in, in in dealing with this problem and pointing out America's America withdrawing from the accord was America's loss, not the rest of the world. So, do you think that? in the future, these countries will be sort of the leaders in helping us reduce our emissions? <laughs> they, they will if they can. The, the, the major problem is, well, the, 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 China's, China's economy is, is, astoni is astonishing. Um, I think they, their, their wealth is going to a point where they can actually put these things into operation, but still being driven by energy. And so... I said early on that the one, once upon a time we knew very well how much, what the uncertainty was on the fossil fuel emissions because it was largely in the West or, you know, or Australia and so on. We don't know that it's become much more uncertain because the number of power plants being built in China, small ones, is enormous. And, you know, one a week or something. And so we no longer know the uncertainty on the fossil fuel emissions. It's becoming more uncertain, so the uncertainty is spreading through the whole system. 
Um, India, I know, as I know less about, it's whether people have options. It's, it's what you, and, and, and Africa's not on there much, by the way. But Africa's got the biggest growth in population and it's the major growth in its poverty, so they will want to burn, they'll want to use a lot more energy. At the moment, actually, in, in the sub-Saharan Africa, the major energy source is wood. It's 90% of the energy is produced by wood. It's not, it's not, but it's still, but wood can be, is it still wood? It's still a fossil fuel. Well, it's not a fossil fuel, it's a fuel that gives a lot of uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Okay. Um, I just had a question about the methane and this whole thing because I always associated it with an important factor for a, a positive feedback within the climate system, like the, the methane that comes from permafrost thaw, for example. Do we know more now about how methane might actually affect like reaching certain climate targets in the future when certain feedback loops get intensify, let's say? Um, we know more, but not enough. You know, this is a it's a relatively young sciences, actually, and you need, and we're short on data. Our models are still pretty crummy, to be honest. I mean, that's the, the, the number of things they predict wrongly is is, is enormous. But um, and and the time, the, there's a mixture. Sorry, the, the, you've asked me a very complicated question, so let me just get my mind in, in order here. There are positive feedbacks and negative feedbacks. So, for example. So as you said, if you, um, if you, a simple one, not so much in carbon cycle, is, uh, is one if you, uh, if you melt snow, you leave um, dark land, so the albedo goes down, so you absorb more radiation, okay? Now, in, for carbon cycle, it's a little, there are positive and negative feedbacks. So, for example, if you have more carbon dioxide, plants love carbon dioxide, so they, 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 and if you have a warm, wet, and, and lots of carbon dioxide, they grow. So for example, in the, uh, if, you ever go, if you're ever able to go to the uh, lunar module in, in Beijing, which is they simulate the, uh, uh, and, and they've got a, a closed uh, system where a bunch of people live in this module with no contact with the outside world at all, and they grow crops. And they keep the CO2 at about one and a half times Ambient UK, uh, ambient Earth, because it's better for the for what they're growing, okay, um, and they keep it warm. But then you've got negative feedbacks because what happens is as you get warmer, the soils respire more. It's an exponential growth, okay. So it gets warmer, so then you get more CO2. And in fact, this balance between uh, soil and uh, and um, plant responses is an absolutely critical question, which I'm going to talk about a little bit either tomorrow or tomorrow, it'll be, or it'll be Wednesday, um, because, as I say, the current understanding is the, as, as you warm the soil, the, exp the response will be exponential, but the response of the photosynthesis will not be exponential, and you know as well as I do, that if you've got an exponential growth in one, and you've got, you don't have an exponential growth in the other, they'll cross each other. Once they cross each other, you go from the land being a sink net to a source. And once that happens, the land's no longer is controlling. It's no longer helping to reduce the CO2 in the atmosphere. It's actually acting to increase the CO2 in the atmosphere. And it will accelerate. But meanwhile, meanwhile, up in the atmosphere, You've got clouds, you've got very aerosols, you've got various things going on. So you cannot look at just one of these things and say carbon dioxide is the full story. It's the driver. But it's how does everything else respond as well? And that's what you'll be hearing about and I've heard about, I guess, during the rest of the of the of the course. Okay. So we can go to the uh, next presentation.